And I'm really thrilled to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Carl Diefenbach from the Division of AIDS. So Carl is the director of the Division of AIDS at NIAID, and this is a big job. Um, he is responsible for about 150 federal employees and oversees a budget of around a billion dollars and basically has to um, help coordinate and find synergies between the clinical trials networks working on treatment and prevention, vaccines and other biomedical prevention, network of sites around the globe, and he managed to do this without losing his cool. Um, <laughs> being involved in one of the networks, I know this can be a very challenging, uh, challenging position, but he also oversees a lot of basic science research. and. Um, he has a, um, a PhD from Hopkins in biophysics and previously ran a lab and was also um, overseeing a lab program at NIH. And so it's really a pleasure to have him here with us today to talk about um, HIV research, creating synergies to end AIDS. So thank you for thank coming, you, Carl. It's a pleasure to, to be here and see all of you uh, today. So I accepted this invitation to speak back in April. And it's one of those situations where what could possibly be going on <laughs> in mid-December? How bad can it be? Well, I made it. That's the main thing. And I, I never thought about canceling. So I think this is, it, it was always an important uh, day on my calendar. And it's so good to be here. So um, per the protocol, I have no conflicts. However, if you really think about it for a moment, I probably am the most conflicted person in the room. Because <laughs> there's probably in some way um, I have an interaction with um, most of you at some level through grants and or contracts or, and or past experiences. So I guess we'll just leave it as, as I have no conflict. So I thought um, I would, you know, again, uh, what I'm going to try to do is walk you through where we are currently in the areas of prevention and treatment research and not focus so much on where we've been, but really on the vision of where I think we're headed. And that'll also include some work on cure and vaccines. And really, one of the areas where um, I have been focused is trying to create synergies between behavioral and social science research and biomedical research, because I think this is an area that absolutely needs more attention. Um, and I'll talk about how we see that occurring as we go on. So this is an interesting slide for me because this represents the major clinical trials that have been performed since 2006 to, um, to today. Uh, and the ones in red are the ones, um, I sort of the, the wall of shame that, that failed for one reason or another. Um, and there's some very interesting lessons that can be learned from, uh, from this list. And notice that uh, there's a couple vaccine trials, a couple microbicide trials, um, or, are the primary ones where that we've had issues. And I did include on here um, as a success the licensure of um, Truvada uh, as, as PrEP as a major um, output of the, these programs. So where, where are we today? What have we learned? Well, um, we know that adult medical male circumcision has an impact and is sustained. Um, it, it, there, it, it doesn't attenuate with time. Um, efficacy is not the same as effectiveness. So primarily what we are dealing with in many of our studies are questions of adherence first and foremost. And for both treatment and prevention, adherence is one of the absolutely critical issues. Um, because what we need for treatment obviously is sustained virologic suppression. And we need for prevention is people taking whatever their prevention methodology is on a daily basis. PrEP is licensed um, in the US and is moving toward licensure in other countries. Yet, even though it's one pill once a day with high adherence, PrEP is nearly 100% effective with high adherence. And that remains um, both the challenge and the opportunity. We do have uh, the possibility of correlates of protection. Good to see you. Uh, <laughs> nothing like embarrassing him. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, together, as we go forward, if we realize we need to focus on adherence and we have, need to focus on social and behavioral factors that influence adherence, we need to be able to design these into uh, the biomedical strategies as we move along. So where do we go from here? So just 
where we are today is HIV testing is the beginning of everything. That's how people know. They know their status, that they're either not infected or HIV positive. If they test positive, they must enter the care continuum. And the care continuum is this very complicated pathway that we take patients through from diagnosis, through clinic visits, through primary care visits, through starting therapy, to ART management. And this takes months and months to get to a place of sustained virologic suppression. And so the newest data out of CDC looks like this, that at the end of the day, in the United States, on average, 87% of people are aware of their HIV status. And we run down the list from how much are linked to care, who's retained in care. And in the data that's currently available from the, uh, the CDC, 55% of the people are virally suppressed. This is not very good. This is not going to get us to 90, 90, 90. So are there strategies that we should be experimenting with, or are there models that we should be trying uh, that could be doing something different? So fundamentally, if we think about where we are with ART, um, what I've been saying a lot lately is pills do not take themselves. Um, uh, ART, the, the giving somebody a prescription is an act, but we need to actually engage the patient in ways um, that are effective and maintain them in a team environment <coughs> where they feel welcomed and encouraged and you, know, you can start by asking <clears throat> the patient the question is, what are your goals? What are you seeking to achieve through therapy? You know, can we keep the patient engaged? Can we then have appropriate teams set up where there's follow-up for missed visits, where there, we watch for warning signs of lack of adherence? And so from a, a, a research perspective, understanding the, the, uh, the biological and behavioral and social drivers of non-adherence, primarily stigma, and how do we deal with all, all the different forms of stigma, can we then truly start having an impact? And all, but at the same time, can we approach the clinic differently? And so this is, these next couple slides are about the RAPID model out of UCSF, where they fundamentally take the entire process, going from diagnosis to ART start, and compress it into a very short period around the time of diagnosis. So fundamentally, it requires taking any clinic structure you have, standing it on its head, integrating everybody, making many people do many different tasks. But at the end of the day, with a rapid start, somebody is diagnosed, starts therapy that day. Um, and if you think about it from a, a social experiment standpoint, the individual is probably most vulnerable to new information at the moment of diagnosis. You have this opportunity to help that individual deal with the facts that they have just been presented with of being HIV positive. The idea that you're now, you, you've been diagnosed as HIV positive, your life will not end. We can help you. You can start therapy today if you like. Here's, how, here's what we need to do and here's what we're going to do for you. And we, you were then engaged and, and you created a new type of bond in that crucible of pain that that individual is going through. And also by reaching out to them at that moment, you may do something for reducing uh, the stigma associated with being diagnosed at the same time dealing with uh, the self-inflicted stigma that comes uh, with being diagnosed with HIV. So what does this look like? So if we look at the, what the San Francisco experiment has been, and this was published in, uh, in the summer, is the program was able to achieve sustained virologic remission very quickly within a matter of about six months as opposed to universal ART or the, the more traditional CD4 um, um, guided ART. So to me, I think there's, a, there's something here and there are probably other models that need to be developed, uh, but it requires a, a f everything sort of change. Um, everybody needs to play nicely together in a different way. Um, and I realize this is a challenge, uh, but I think this is an important tool that we will need to have, because if you think about the number of transmissions that can occur in this time frame where people are um, taking up ART, it, we need to, to get, if test and treat is going to be it, we have to get people to this level of 100% and sustained virologic suppression. So why do we care so much about virologic suppression? Why do we care so much about ART? And I think that the, the three studies that we've accomplished 
over the past 10 or 12 years really set the stage for why, for the power of antiretroviral therapy and its ability to truly impact patients' lives. We know from the, start stu the SMART study that episodic heart is terrible, bottom line. You might as well, it's like running your car through the, uh, the salt time after time after time and not washing it off in between. You're just gonna rust out your immune system if you stop and start therapy. Um, we know from HPTN052 that early heart reduces HIV transmission by 93%. But this 93% number is a little bit of a fallacy. It's not 93%, it's 100%. The people who, that this, the, in the intention to treat analysis that this 7% represents are people who had fallen out of care, had a rebound, and there was detectable virus. So if you're suppressed, the number is 100%, the number is zero transmissions. Uh, and then of course, um, the, the START study, which everybody said would be a failure and a flop, and I got excoriated for going forward with it time after time, showed um, uh, the impact of the earliest possible um, interventions uh, in terms of reducing um, TB and cancer and heart disease. And so, you know, those are really, the, the, the cancer piece was profound, and it, it tells us something about the human immune system that we're still struggling to understand. Um, the, the, the downside of HPTN052 is it didn't have a significant number of MSMs. Um, the, um, the Roger study did, um, and in, in the Roger study, um, there was also uh, no transmission seen uh, in, uh, in, in, with, with viral suppression. So I think you know, the, the wrap on 052 is it didn't cover MSMs. I think this solves that issue largely. So I think we can safely say that zero equals zero. Um, and, and take it from there. So clearly we have the reason to start therapy is the public health benefit as well as the individual benefit. And I don't understand clinicians who are still reticent to not start their patients. It remains a mystery to me. And it, it, this has then been translated into guidelines. You know, by the strength of the recommendation it was changed um, to an A1, which is exactly where it should be. So I think the next step for the guidelines committee is to go back and look at the language around transmission. And uh, we'll see what Alice and uh, Chip and Marty uh, and Cliff Lane can do about that. So let's talk about where we are today with antiretroviral therapy. I mean, we're in a really good place with, with ART. As current therapy is more than sufficient to maintain disease-free and non-transmissible state as long as people reliably take their medications. But if we're going to advance therapy, we can advance on two fronts. Can we improve adherence by going with long acting? And, and so like with, like with prevention, can we move into a realm where we have an injectable or implantable regimens? And as the drugs come along, I'm seeing a, a, a time in a, a point in time in the, in the relatively near future where for treatment and prevention, we will probably have injectables or implantables that will last six months or a year. And that will be an, an additional game changer um, when we can get to, to that level. But ultimately, what we need to do is also continue to improve ART. So it takes on some other properties that can help us in the area of, of HIV persistence. So we need to be able to get people virally suppressed so we can move toward um, looking at these questions of persistence. But what we need to do is get to a point where we can stop therapy and have sustained virologic uh, suppression. But what we, this is the current state of the art. Um, this was one of the first studies that was done where people were treated and treated well for a number of years. Bottom line is most rebounded and most rebounded um, within the, the first 20 to 30 days. The occasional patient may control. Chances are that patient would have controlled anyway and maybe hadn't, shouldn't have been on, didn't need to be on therapy. They could have been an, an elite controller at that point. So this is the challenge we face is can we then, when people stop, can they, can they control? So if we're gonna talk about a cure or um, sustained virologic suppression in the absence of therapy, really what we're seeking is uh, a strategy for treatment that is simple, that doesn't require tertiary care, safe, it, it can't be any worse than what we have today. People are gonna use anti-PD-1 antibodies where we see in cancer that we're rotting out people's hearts we can't do that. We cannot have that be part of our regimen. First, do no harm. 
Um, and ultimately, we needed this to be scalable because the a bone marrow transplant or the kind of thing that the, um, uh, the Berlin patient went through is not sustainable, scalable, or practical at any level. So again, you all know this very well. You have one of um, the leading people in the field who wants to cure mice. Uh, <laughs> uh, here. Mice are people too. Yeah. Uh, just like corporations are people. Um, so we want to be able to um, eradicate using a sterilizing cure, but also there's the, the strategy of a functional cure. Uh, and uh, you know, we need to think about, they're both uh, um, at this point still aspir, <laughs> the, the buttons are so small. Let's see if this works, there we go. So um, yeah, this is, it's been flashing like this the whole time. That's why I keep looking at the screen. So you know, one of the, the questions, one of the debates was, uh, what is the evidence for persistence? And this was um, the case of the, the Mississippi child where it was absolutely clear. And you know, when Debbie first presented this, Debbie Prasad first presented this at Croy, there were a lot of people in the background going, eh, eh, eh. the child was never infected. It was you know, essentially, um, it was something else. But the fact that that child rebounded was proof that there were there was a persistent viral reservoir that was sustained. What rebounded was one clone that was uh, you know, identical to her, her mother's virus. Um, and it really was, uh, as, as, as depressing as that was, having that rebound, it really solidified the fact that viral persistence is real and it, it, um, it is one of the challenges we face. So, um, in terms of what we are doing today for eradication, there are a variety of strategies that involve, if you have a latently infected cell, we need to be able to act, activate it and then kill it. Um, and there's all kinds of strategies under, uh, under exploration in terms of methods of ex activation and approaches to killing. Uh, immunological methods may be quite a challenge, particularly when you have uh, the full gene expression of an HIV virus, because NEF does tend to downregulate uh, CD4 and the appropriate signals so that the cell is then blind to the immune system. But ultimately, we need a variety of systems. And perhaps ART can play a role here. Can you design therapy that in addition to um, suppressing the virus will kill the activated, an activated cell um, at the same time? So I think there's some interesting drug discovery components that can go into this um, that we still have in development. Additionally, there's an, a set of ideas about can you permanently put the provirus to sleep? Um, and there's a very interesting set of findings on microRNAs and, and RNAs that are copied off the non-coding strand of the virus that are playing a role in maintenance of, um, of, of HIV latency. And, and those other gene products may also be very useful in terms of targets for immunity. Because if you are making a protein off the opposite strand, could you then attack that cell um, as a latently infected cell um, through the expression of that specific set of epitopes? So there's a lot here that, um, that is yet to be um, exploited in a good way. Now let's see. There we go. So let's talk about functional cure. So many of you have seen this paper, and I think this is a really good example of where you don't know where the next kind of breakthrough is coming from. This was a paper that appeared in, um, in October. Uh, and those of you who attended R4P or attended the NIH Cure Mission saw Dr. Fauci make this presentation. But I just think it's important to, to share with, um, with you um, some of the details of this finding. So fundamentally, what they did is they took a series of non-human primates and infected them for a reasonable period of time, for five weeks. So it's not like if you stopped early, early, early in acute infection. You actually had the peak, you had an immune response, and you actually had some level of control starting back to occur. So you had a, the ability to establish a, re a reservoir and also to lead to some virus being trapped on FDCs and other places. Uh, you started therapy, they started therapy, and the therapy lasted um, through period uh, two, phase two and three. They started with injections of, uh, of an antibody against a, an ICAM called alpha-4-beta-7. 
um, which is expressed at very high levels on CD4 and very close to CD4. It's one of the, um, the critical um, uh, uh, integrants involved in CD4 signaling, followed by um, treatment withdrawal of the ART, followed by um, ultimately stopping the, the antibody. And so those are the, these are the phases laid out again. The infection was um, with a cloned virus, MAC239, treatment, sustained treatment with antibody and heart, just heart, um, uh, then uh, just the anti-alpha-4, beta-7, followed by withdrawal. And so this is a summary slide of the data. So you have the periods, but what's impressive is that there was a viral rebound, but ultimately the vast majority of the animals um, that were treated with the anti-alpha-4, anti beta-7 controlled to a point by 50 weeks, they were aviremic. Um, so this, uh, so were, there were three animals that were excluded from this group that, were, that started, and that's not shown on this slide here, but they developed anti-drug antibody. And so they um, were excluded, um, but the IgG control behaved as you would expect any macaque to behave. So this has gone on. Uh, additional interesting uh, analysis was looking at proviral DNA uh, in gut lymphoid tissue. And the, the, the animals that rebounded, really well-established reservoirs and, and DNA in the gut, whereas the animals in the, in the treated group also um, uh, appeared to clear or dilute out, depending on uh, the mechanism, which is unknown at this point, uh, by 50 weeks. Now the interesting thing about these animals is they've now, they're now at two years. And there has been no rebound. And a series of experiments have been attempted on them, like the CD, anti-CD8 depletion experiments. None of that has borne fruit yet. So this is an area where um, you scratch your head and go, well, so what's next? Well, lo and behold, a company called Takeda has a monoclonal antibody, Vegolizumab, which is an anti-alpha-4 beta-7 that's used and licensed for use in um, inflammatory bowel disorders. Um, and uh, the NIH has started a clinical trial on this to look at the safety um, and, uh, and impact. Um, there's the clinicaltrials.gov identifier. 15 patients are, are to be studied with the possibility of going up to 25. The first patients have been enrolled. We're expecting data from this study um, maybe by the spring. But in parallel to this, we're trying to take a different approach on, on this, um, uh, this concept. So very quickly, we have reached out to um, the Cure TSG of the ACTG, to the uh, US Military HIV Research Program, because uh, uh, Jintana Arawanovich has been a big player in this area try to get to a point where the, these three groups can coordinate and collaborate on next steps. There's going to, and we intend to have some meetings in the spring about this. At the same time, this screams for replication in terms of the non-human primate study. So we're gearing up to initiate um, a, a replication of the study as well as then do things like change the virus, change the dose of the antibody, change the timing of the antibody get a, a, a cohort of animals that have been infected a hell of a lot longer than five weeks, get them on, on the treatment and then repeat the experiment. So this is the very early days here, but we're going to take this as an, as an approach of being inclusive and transparent as we move forward. Um, and so stay tuned. Uh, we'll see how this all goes. So the fundamental issue here also is for as many investigators are in this field, everybody has a different opinion on why this works. Because um, there, there, there currently aren't any clues other than what we know about what the antibody does, um, and it, it may or may not be relevant. So everybody, we're in a data-free zone here, but like with many things we have in, in Washington these days, there are lots of data-free zones. Uh, so this is just another one, but we intend to get data um, and get an answer to, to these questions. So going ahead, let's talk a little bit about HIV prevention um, and the prevention continuum. So this is one of those ones that, from a, a structural standpoint, um, we're really good at treatment. We have Ryan White. We have all the right tools. But prevention is 
really one of the big challenges we face in terms of getting prevention services to people. So um, this is an area that we, um, as it, it's not necessarily NIH's responsibility, but can CDC and HRSA come together and do a little bit more in this area. The, the data on PrEP is astoundingly bad um, in, in terms of the uptake is there, but it's in um, basically rich white MSM and the people who need it the most don't have access. They don't have insurance. So we need to do, part of this is building a, a, a service provider continuum that could help deliver PrEP and or other prevention services in a way. Because the CDC is not funded or equipped um, to do this in a, in a way that is really impactful. Individual jurisdictions, um, San Francisco, Washington DC and others are busy um, putting those in place, but it's the power of the local health department. So clearly what we need to be able to do is test negative, have risk counseling and stratification, a tailored set of prevention services that could be rolled out. Um, retain, again, retention in the services, adherence to services, again, the same principles of, of care where it's um, not, where there's continuity and people feel welcomed back into the office with adherence support, repeat HIV testing. And I think the biggest thing that, and this is both a, a good thing and a bad thing, is going to be STI services. So if you think about it from the standpoint of taking somebody, uh, a young man who's on PrEP and comes in with rectal gonorrhea, and he's not HIV infected, that is such a teaching lesson. Treat the, the rectal gonorrhea and say, you are fortunate, but Think about this from the, how, how good your PrEP was that it protected you from getting HIV. And then that will be an adherence booster. And then hopefully they'll come back before their symptoms get so bad that they, um, with whatever, whether it's syphilis or gonorrhea the next time. So this is the challenge we face, is being able to, as clinicians, being able to, to get in and deal with these individuals and deal with the, the, the specific tough questions about behavior, um, about risk, um, about condom use. Again, the, many of these young men won't want to use condoms, but if they're not going to use condoms, make sure they come back for appropriate STI screening. So we have the, you know, what goes in a prevention toolkit? And this is what we're struggling with in South Africa, um, is uh, PrEP is not part of the prevention package in South Africa, only for um, commercial sex workers at this point. But the rest of these pieces could be in terms of um, needle exchange, um, STI treatment. Medical male circumcision is available in, in South Africa. They're struggling with some level of rollout, um, but all of these can come together. But what, ultimately what you need to do is build a prevention package that is specific for the target population. So where are we today? HIV testing is the, as I've said, uh, is the input, is where you start. You, you know your and, that, and somehow that needs to be promoted and given special, you know, there's special badge, I know my status kind of button, um, so that uh, whether you're positive or negative, you're honored for knowing your status. Um, therapy is a cornerstone of what we need to do in prevention. We need to reduce the number of viremic people um, simply because that will reduce the pool for exposure. Uh, so that gets back to the whole business of adherence, adherence, adherence. Um, we need, uh, and this is where every epidemic is different and every population, target population is different. So can we tailor prevention packages based on cost, population, and effectiveness, but also make the prevention package of interest and desirable to the target population? Uh, that is a part of the challenge. Can you use social and behavioral research tools to figure out what people are interested in using? I mean, we. As we've gone back in the, um, in the VOICE trial and in the ASPIRE trial, talked about pills, young women in South Africa are not interested in Truvada for pills. They walk around on the Matatu and they're, they're shaking in their purse and everybody thinks they're infected. It's a stig the, the pills themselves are stigmatizing. Either we need to change the packaging of the pills, but in talking to Gilead, you can't put Truvada in a blister pack. It has to be packed with a desiccant. So maybe TAF will be better down the road, but we'll have to wait and see. But we need some clever packaging on it 
So that um, we don't have the, just the associated stigma of, of pills. So can you create bling with pills? Uh, the, the, the joke is maybe the ring was all bling, but, and that it was worn and not used, but we just don't know. <laughs> so we need to be able to then um, figure out how to more effectively use PrEP as well as evolve PrEP and monitor and evolve prevention strategies as we have an impact in the epidemic. Uh, the epidemic's going to change, and then the prevention package may need to change, and what you're doing may, do, may need to change depending on uh, progress in specific population. So, uh, you know, this is not new news. Um, PrEP is one pill once a day, um, although we've had Ypergay and Proud and other studies that have looked at other dosing regimens. Our studies haven't really shown that um, it has, it has worked as well as, uh, say, the French have seen. But PrEP is about adherence. Um, PrEP is not a magic bullet um, by itself in any way, shape, or form. Again, pills don't take themselves. It has to be embedded in a package that is delivered in a behavioral and social context where people understand what, is, what they're agreeing to and then counseled and appropriately um, supported as they move along. And I can't say enough about needing to address adherence issues. So as we move forward with the new agents, um, uh, I don't know, somebody said to me today, um, uh, VRC01 was the AZT of antibodies. And I so agree with that, because that's about the level of effect uh, that we see with that antibody. Um, AZT was pretty darn good in 076. Um, what we see in AMP will be a very interesting result. Uh, that's the big antibody study. But what we have is long-acting rings, plus or minus contraception, possibly, if that comes along. The issue I have is um, what we need are, my, are, are PrEP agents that protect against all routes of exposure. And I think that, that as we go forward, that's the advantage of long-acting injectables and implantables. Um, and cabotegravir um, is the first off the dime. And so we had the ring study, which as Aspire evolved into HOPE, and that is open. We're specifically looking at adherence issues in, these, the, in women. Of what does it look like if, if you tell a, a young woman that she can participate in the trial, she can get all the benefits of being in the study, but you don't have to use the ring. It's okay. Just tell us you're not going to use it. We're not going to force it on you. You'll get the other adherence pieces. What is the level of uptake in that situation? It's going to be an eye-opener, no, one way or the other. So that study's up and going. And I think that's a really important design. So we're not somehow pushing the, the product on the participant. Uh, and the, the, re, the, the retraining of the staff at the sites has been a very interesting process as we've gone through this, because they've been so uh, inculcated with this idea that you know, they have to take, use the ring. They have to take it and use it and use it and use it. Now you're asking them to, you've, you've rocked their view of the world by, by telling them they no longer have to push the ring quite so hard. But the good news is we have the cabotegravir studies. And so I was able to go in and edit the slide, the last moment, to say that we are not necessarily open in enrolling, but we're open in screening and getting close to initiating um, 083. And the first site is here. And the second site is in Chicago. and so. Congratulations to the PTM. Congratulations to Rafi for getting this up and going. And congratulations to all of it. So this reflects very well on UCLA. So you all should be very proud of that it, it, it's starting here, as this is a game changer. The combination of these two studies, uh, the men's study uh, uh, that is in the Americas, and then the women's study, which we're still struggling with the design. Uh, we still don't have, we still know if it's going to finally be open label or not. We'll lead, we'll have the power to license um, this as a, um, as a prevention strategy. So stay tuned. This is going to be um, a journey of years because uh, that's the way these things go. So let's spend, let's close and um, talk about the need for a safe, effective, and durable um, HIV vaccine. And we've, there are essentially two competing strategies right now. Um, one is the empiric strategy, which is based primarily on the RV144 result. And then the other is based on uh, the idea that you could design a vaccine that could produce the broad neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. And ultimately, 
maybe some combination of the two will be needed. So let's talk about the empiric approach. Well, we have not done so well with this. So um, going back to the, the different studies that we've done, um, I became acting division director um, two weeks before the STEP trial DSMB. <laughs> really interesting time. Um, and then not only are you showing no effect, but you are actually have the appearance of harm. Uh, and, and through the studies of follow-up on STEP and Pombili, we demonstrated that um, young, uncircumcised men um, were at higher risk of if they were vaccinated, if they were of ad, if they were ad positive, at a higher risk of acquisition. So then we had the bright idea: if you stick your finger in a light socket, will it happen a second time? So we went ahead and did another ad five trial, um, HVTN five hundred five, which was Gary Nabel's product at the VRC. But we excluded MSM that were um, ad zero positive, and we didn't see harm we saw no level of activity. So now it's time to take a new approach. And, it, and b building off of RV144, we have spent the last seven years trying to understand why this worked, how it worked, and then design a regimen that could work in, in South Africa. And just over the last two weeks, we opened the study um, that that the, the, the big efficacy study. And what we had done in the meantime is we had determined these correlates of an, anti, an IgG against the V1, V2, non-neutralizing antibodies that could mediate ADCC, and then an IgA response, which actually correlated with the risk of, of increased infection, but it wasn't your classic um, methodology that it would actually enhance infection. It actually was the IgAs were competing with the IgGs. And I think that's an important distinction. So this study, we took the design, we built it, we tested it in a study called HVTN100. It passed all its marks. Uh, and then, so we are reasonably satisfied that we are testing a vaccine that has slightly, that it has improved strength, possibly using multiple boosts, it modified vector and new adjuvants. We're gonna evaluate in 702 for better strength, better breadth, and better durability. Um, we've launched, uh, we'll enroll over the next 20 months, and then probably within 12 months, if there's a strong signal, we'll actually have a hint. So that'd be 32 months from now. Mark your calendars. And that, that's this. Uh, that was the, we, were, we notified the world that we were going to launch um, in November, and we did. Uh, this was when we result, released the results of um, the um, HVTN 100 study, and that was then also discussed at Durban uh, at AIDS 2016. So let's talk a minute about uh, making a, de a deductive-based vaccine. So there's a fundamental assumption in this um, strategy, and that is do broad neutralizing antibodies, if induced by a vaccine, will they afford protection against HIV? That's, that's uh, th we don't know. And to a certain extent, that, this is the question that AMP will answer. And the answer may be yes, but you need 50 to 100 micrograms per mil of antibody in the bloodstream in order for this to work. Um, in which case, this methodology is, it will not work. You cannot have that level of induction. It may be that if we're in the five to 10 range, this will be fine. So I think that AMP is an important piece in our understanding of whether or not uh, this strategy will actually work. Um, and that's enrolling uh, really well right now. So it has been truly a scientific tour de force. As you take the, that sort of gray blob in the background that is the HIV trimer and map where all the broad neutralizing antibodies have been shown to bind, um, there, are any, there are a large number of sites where the monoclonals all bind. But these monoclonals, um, when triggered in infected people, are triggered in people that are not virologically suppressed, and they really don't have that big of an impact on, on disease progression. Although um, VRCO1 and all the derivatives of VRCO1 are isolated from an individual who's um, a long-term non-progressor. So he has, that individual has relatively low viral load, um, but 
What we don't know is the role of the antibody versus any T cell help or CD8 response that's there. But we have all these antibodies. Can we figure out how to use them? But ultimately, the goal is to take those sites, build an immunogen that can then reproducibly induce the, these broad neutralizing antibodies. So uh, this is in its own way a, a bit of, um, of magic is required uh, because of the complication and the differences between all the, the broad neutralizing antibodies. So NIH has made some very big bets in this space too with, uh, with two Chavis, one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast, as well as uh, our own VRC um, at the NIH. So stay tuned on this one. Uh, there are a few immunogens that are now entering trial, but this is very early days. And um, so far, it isn't exactly thoroughly promising at this point. No time will tell. So the question I pose to all of us, and this is a, the challenge to me as um, the person who really sees this as a, a very important time in HIV treatment and prevention research is how are we going to, how's this slide going to look for me in five years? Where how much red is going to be here in terms of, of trials that have failed miserably? How much is going to be black? But ultimately, at the end of the day, what have we been able to take and then put into clinical practice so that we can uh, actually impact uh, people's lives? So in conclusion, um, this is my concluding slides. I think we are really, uh, I'm a, a very optimistic person in case you can't tell. Uh, we are on uh, a fast track to, I think, if we can get all these things done, um, to helping to bring about the end of the, uh, the pandemic at some level, at least control it. I think a vaccine is within our grasp. Um, if it's not uh, this version of um, the RV144 material, maybe the next one in combination with other things, I think we will see a higher efficacy signal from this. We really need... Um, to continue to figure out in the future when we design prevention and treatment modalities, bring in the behavioral and social scientists from the beginning so that we're designing these products with the end user in mind, not from the API perspective, but from the standpoint of how, does, how will this pill, how will this strategy work in the context of people's lives? And that's one of the things I think about implants is that I think they'll be a little bit um, more approachable for people but time will tell. But we need to make sure that we do this in a co as a collective moving forward. We really need to continue to push very hard on getting immediate therapy for all HIV-infected people. And this needs to be, um, it's a healthcare delivery issue. It is a physician um, quantity as well as quality issue in terms of having the right, uh, the healthcare providers, not just domestically, but internationally as well. Uh, and this needs to be a standard, and it needs to be embraced um, in a way that uh, makes it easier for the HIV-infected population to understand uh, what we're seeking to achieve. I really think there needs to be innovation on both the therapeutic armamentarium as well as PrEP by going with long-acting for both. Uh, I think that would be, because uh, in my view, if you had essentially the same formulation as an injectable, or an implantable for treatment or prevention, everybody who comes to the clinic could get the same thing. And so, to my mind, that's destigmatizing. Others may, I don't know, that'd be an interesting question to go through, uh, but to sort through. Uh, some people may view it as, as maximally stigmatizing, because then every, uh, you've essentially identified the population who are in treatment or at risk. But if Everybody in a population, like in Sub-Saharan Africa and um, South Africa, virtually everybody, young women in particular, are all at risk. There's no, no differentiation based on anything. It has to, to help. I think um, we continue to need to expand uh, ARV-based prevention. I think this is a healthcare delivery issue. Broad neutralizing antibodies are going to come into this someplace, um, maybe not so much in cure right now unless we figure out how to modify them to be bispecific, uh, but maybe in treatment. We we'll definitely have long-acting ones that are going to go at least six months, um, maybe a year. But at the end of the day, these are the tools that will help us control the pandemic. But the tools will not do it alone. Pills don't take themselves. We're going to have to do this as a community of providers um, and, um, and scientists. So thank you for your attention. That was terrific. We're up.
optimist here at UCLA, and I heard today on the radio that you live longer if you're an optimist. So, <laughs> so we have time for uh, for some questions. I'm sure there's lots of questions from this group. Um, yes, Sally. Hi. Um, I uh, told you mentioned drugs. Yeah, so, so drug resistance, so if you look at it from a PrEP perspective, there's been uh, two cases of transmitted drug resistance. They made the news. So in that sense, you know, yeah, I suppose at some level it, it could become a problem. The other issue that we face, particularly um, in sub-Saharan Africa, is we need to move to an integrase-based regimen. And that will have a profound impact on the current level of resistance that we're seeing on the NNRTIs. So I think we need to continue to optimize the regimens and move to the best drugs. And I think that we've seen the better heart is resistance has stayed constant or decreased. And I think changing ART to these newer regimens will make a big difference and continue to drop the, the resistance challenges. I think the, the generation of people we mistreated with monotherapy, combination therapy, and then early heart are sort of a our legacy of past sins that we need to, to manage, um, and that's where continuing to get new drugs for them uh, as they age up will, will be important as well. Yes, Jeff. Uh, I'm an optimist, but I'll be a realist. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned a few times that you know, these wonderful tools we've developed um, with billions of dollars of investment at NIH you know, failed to get implemented as sort of gaps in our healthcare delivery system, our prevention delivery system. Um, you know, what the big brains in Washington, at least the current ones, um, are there? You know, think about <laughs> solutions, you know, for that. So, you know, when the United States successfully controlled the syphilis epidemic in the 1940s, you know, it stood up syphilis screening and testing and treatment programs um, at every street corner in the United States. You have really empowered county, local public health programs. You said San Francisco, Washington, you know, are two shining examples, but it's extremely rare that there's any really local public health infrastructure that's functional in the United States. Um, so, you know, what have people been thinking about CDC and NIH about how to, you know, translate these tools and, and implement them? Oh, I wish I had an answer to your question. Um, we know who at least the nominee is for HHS secretary who oversees um, uh, H, uh, NIH and CDC. And um, uh, his track record is uh, a little less than stellar in, in this area. I mean, considering he's from Atlanta, um, and while well, the CDC building itself was not within his jurisdiction, he was sitting on, in his relatively affluent Congressional District, a fairly significant heroin epidemic and a fairly significant um, HIV outbreak. Um, I mean, there's more, Atlanta is really sort of the uh, ground zero right now in terms of the number of people who are viremic. Um, and I, I, I don't have an answer for you, but it, it, clearly we all have a role and a responsibility to continue to talk to our congressmen, um, and I don't want to was my job over lobbying too hard, but really, um, this is going to be a, ch a very interesting time over the next four years. It, it's a reality. I'm gonna, my job is to get the tools licensed and then partner with people like PEPFAR to see how to implement, um, assuming that we still have PEPFAR and we still have CDC, we'll continue to do that kind of thing. I think that just to comment on that a little bit more. It does seem like part of our responsibility as people who do research in this area is to help educate the public about how close we are to really controlling the epidemic if we successfully deploy the tools that we have. And we, we don't you know, find the venues for doing that, but I, I do think that's a really critical thing because people really question, you know, all this investment in HIV over the last 30 years has really created a tremendous armamentarium of, of interventions and 
trying to find a way to sort of close the deal over the next 10 years or completely lose control of it. I think those yeah. are the... I think that's a, that's a really good point, Judy. The, the, so you can phrase it in an elevator speech. Do you want to be the group that is responsible for prolonging the epidemic or do you want to be the group that finally ends it? Off we go. Off we go. One last comment. Where do things stand uh, budget-wise um, in terms of, I know, I know there were years where you did not receive increases and then it started up again. And how is that kind of now distributed uh, in terms of the laboratory science versus the clinical trials, uh, prevention trials versus therapy, just a, a rough sort of. So what, we are, what we've gone through so in 2012, NIH went through a revisioning of priorities um, where HIV prevention, lowering incidence was the highest priority, um, innovative treatments and cure were, were second, and then uh, next step down was dealing with the non-infectious and infectious comorbidities. Those were the priorities. And so what you've seen is a little bit of a redistribution upwards toward prevention. Um, cure has been pretty, and treatment has been constant, um, and then Interventions in the area of comorbidities, for example, reprieve, um, another very important study that we're actively engaged in of testing a statin to see if it can have an impact uh, when not necessarily needed for your own health, um, uh, will make a difference. By and large, the, it's been at the margins, a little bit here, a little bit there. But the other problem we faced is that it used to be we were uh, allocated 10% of the HIV of the uh, the NIH budget. That went away. We're no longer guaranteed of getting 10%. We're we're now pretty much capped at, at all of NIH um, getting approximately three billion. Tom Price and the potential candidates for uh, the current named candidates for um, NIH director are opposed to us keeping even the three billion. So this is going to be a very interesting time as we go through and sort this out um, with uh, new leadership. Peter. Hi. Great. Uh, two quick ones. One is related to the um, rolling out needs at the beginning. The important <coughs> contact we have is first HIV tests and bringing them to care, which ties into a more general issue of broadening. We consider broadening not just into HIV and STI care, but actually into care in general, which is turning out to be a huge thing. And it, I'm just working with dental folks who run the dental program in Wisconsin. The same thing, if they can show evidence of bringing more kids into care for general, and it's, it, again, it's destigmatizes helps. Mm -hmm. Then at the parallel, and I sent around, I think you may have gotten a copy, but the California, Care California put out their medals levels of cost of prep to the point that even if you're in good plans, there's still about $1,000 a month to pay, and that's your deductible, and that's in all levels of metal plans, and those are the best. So much of this discussion that we end up doing our research on is not clinically relevant in the real world of people, so we need to bring back, again, your point to the real world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The more focused question has to do with a little bit of a bias, but I actually wonder if there's a need for mucosal immunology assays going forward in both the combination of different access of prevention drugs to look at drug concentrations and also for reservoirs. If the efforts that we are beginning to see can be done with peripheral blood, do we really not need mucosal analogy parts and tissues to look at compartments that much anymore? Can we get around it? I, uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I think that each, each new drug needs to be evaluated um, in that way, it remains to be seen. So I, coming back to your first point, I actually think like blood pressure, like uh, an EKG, an HIV test should be part of every single time you go have a checkup, period. Um, to me, that, that just makes sense. Um, and it doesn't matter who you are. It's, just, it's, a, it's something that just should be done routinely. And frankly, for people of our age, you should also get a hep C test. And so that, um, uh, that's another one that I think we, I, we can st continue to struggle to try to get um, implemented. Okay. I don't know the answer. It's a good question. So kind of to follow up on what you're both saying, if you're rolling that out to take us beyond just the HIV docs, and now you're talking about primary care physicians, and, and that rapid 
study from UCSF is so powerful, those resources aren't going to be present nope. in the primary care doctor's office. Or, or necessarily are they going to be educated for it? So is this something that needs to be incorporated now into medical school curricula to bring up the next generation? I think that that's the challenge we face is that primary care physicians don't like to talk about sex. Um, frankly, they don't have the time or their practices are set up. What? You don't get paid. I think that you have to realize it's not only a question of being taught, but everything's being driven by you have X number of minutes with a patient and you're not going to get reimbursed for doing all the complicated yeah. counseling. Yeah, I understand. You know, this is, we, these are the big issues that we need to struggle with. I don't have solutions to that, but it is a challenge. But at least the goal is that what? We can achieve. We know we, we know we know that we needed we knew what we needed to do. We just needed to figure out how well, to get thank there. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much.